and it looks like we're live. Uh, hello everyone, welcome to yet another uh, Siggy's Poor Box stream. Those of you who were already anticipating the stream might know what we're talking about today. The topic is going to be poor storage. Yeah, it's uh, possibly one of the most complicated and potentially controversial topics in uh, the entire poor community. Everyone of course has their own opinions on how to store poor, their own preferences and everything. And today I'm here to tell you about mine. Now, before we start this, I purposely haven't watched any of Gabriele's videos on poor storage because for this stream we wanted to provide a perspective that's maybe a bit different. So I did my research, I put my notes together, and what I'm going to tell you today will be unbiased by what Gabriele said in his videos. So there may be some differences, there may be some contradictions, uh, it's definitely going to be interesting to see where both of us differ, where we've got some common ground, etc. Also, this stream will get quite technical. If you have any questions at any point or uh, would like for me to repeat or clarify something, just let me know in chat and I'll do my best to answer everything. I'm already seeing a bunch of our uh, regular visitors in chat. It's nice to see you all again, especially after I've uh, taken a bit of a break due to studying lately. So I hope you'll all uh, join me for some tea drinking and storage discussion today. Now, this stream is going to have four sections. The first one is going to be the theory behind poor aging. So, on a biological and chemical level, what actually goes on in poor tea as it ages. The second one is looking at that theory and formulating a set of storage goals. So, what do we want to achieve with our personal poor storage? The third section will go into how we can achieve these goals, what we need to do, what kind of equipment, what kind of conditions we need to make aging at home possible. And lastly, after we've talked about all of these things, I'm going to show you the best solution I've found so far, my personal uh, storage setup that I use at home. Alright, before we get started, uh, as I've already told people in chat, please, for this stream, uh, get out whatever your favorite and most well-aged poor tea in your collection is, and uh, enjoy that along with me. Personally, I'm uh, drinking this today, the uh, 2013 Jaguan Love Forever. Uh, this one might not exactly seem like the oldest tea given the 2013 on the wrapper and all, but its material is actually from 2003, so it's uh, got a bit of age on it by now. It's also a tea I've uh, had a couple of different versions from that all differed in storage, so given that we're talking about storage today, I felt uh, this was the appropriate choice. Now, I've already uh, preheated my pot, I boiled my water, so I broke off this uh, little 7 gram chunk here that I'm going to prepare in my usual teapot. I'm going to do that now, and while I do that, we can get started on talking about the theory behind poor aging. Which is going to be our first of four topics for tonight. Oh, well, not tonight, it's afternoon in Germany, um, for today. Just give me a second to rinse this. I'm also gonna mute myself for a moment because I think I need to reboil this water. So please give me, like, a minute.
All right, uh, my water is boiling. I'm about to do the first steep now. And while that first steep is preparing, let's start talking about poor aging. Now, aging and poor has two compounds. The first one is oxidation, and the second one is the activity of microorganisms. The reason behind this is that the enzymes in poor tea are still active because of a slightly different kilgreen process and due to sun drying instead of drying with hot air, which is a lot more common in other types of tea. These two different compounds are affected by three different parameters. We've got temperature, humidity, and enzyme quantity or activity. Oh, Gabriela is also joining us. Uh, hello and welcome to the stream. Now, looking at this, enzyme activity likely seems to be a big contributing factor to what uh, poor storage actually aims to, let's say, improve or maintain. And there are a few things to know about that. Enzyme activity in tea peaks at around 35 to 40 degrees Celsius. So there's one of the parameters we're talking about, temperature. Humidity also affects enzyme act uh, activity to some extent. Higher humidity usually means more activity. The uh, enzyme activity in the tea overall is also based on another factor, and that is fungal growth. The reason behind this is that fungi release enzymes that penetrate the cell structure of the leaves, which then in turn leads to the oxidation of the polyphenols present in tea. The catechins, the theaflavins, the tannins, and the flavonoids. The presence of compounds like uh, epigallocatechin gallate, epicatechin gallate, camphorol, quercetin, and myrosetin in tea are what contributes to the tea's bitter flavor and astringent texture. The fungi in the tea produce polyphenol oxidase, which reacts with these polyphenols that I just mentioned and causes oxidation, causes the cell structure to break down, that is the actual process of aging. That's what changes the flavor of the tea. Now, this uh, polyphenol oxidase, coincidentally, is also the same enzyme that's involved in the browning of fruit. So if you slice open an apple and let it sit on your kitchen counter for, uh, I don't know, half an hour, you will notice some browning. And that is due to polyphenol oxidase, which is also present in most plant matter by itself, including tea. So that is one of the things that contributes to the enzymatic activity in poor tea. Now, one of the parameters I outlined is humidity. Where does humidity come into play with all of these? <sighs> Different humidity ranges lead to the growth of different types of fungi. Not all kinds of fungi produce the types of enzymes that we would want in our tea. This means that we should fine-tune our humidity in a way where we produce only a certain type of fungus. There are, there's also the possibility of producing toxic fungi if we have too much humidity. So, uh, this factor in particular is something we need to be very careful about. <coughs> now, another let's say, factor that's influenced by humidity is the growth of bacteria in our tea. Bacterial growth definitely needs to be accounted for 
because in Shangpur we want to avoid bacterial growth. Which is another reason why our humidity shouldn't be too high. Alright. So this is basically a simple outline of what we need to look at, what we want to promote, and how poor aging happen uh, functions on a biological and chemical level. I hope you've all gotten your teas ready by now. I've uh, started drinking some of this Jaguan. I hope you could see it a bit there. It's quite nice. Also, greetings to my uh, friends from the Munich Tea community that are watching right now. Hello, Jens. Hello, Ralf. Okay. A quick note on this tea. Uh, one of the reasons why I really like it, and why it fits so well for this particular stream, is that this uh, Jaguan Love Forever can develop a type of cherry-like note under the right storage conditions. If your storage is too conservative, you're not going to get that note. If your storage is too aggressive, you're not going to get it either because it's going to be drowned out by other more musty flavors. But this one in particular is just right in my opinion. It's got the cherry note, it's got a bit of that herbaceousness that you get from poor, sort of a dried herbs kind of thing. It's also fairly resinous, it has good texture. Uh, this one in particular, I think, would be an example of this tea with what I would consider good storage. And yeah, what we're here for today is figuring out how we can achieve that good storage. Because obviously most of us don't live in places like uh, Guangdong or Hong Kong or Taiwan where the uh, natural storage conditions are essentially perfect for our tea. So, one of the points I mentioned just now is humidity. In particular, relative humidity is important for the things I just outlined. As a sort of rule of thumb, we can say below 60% relative humidity, there's not going to be any fungal growth in our tea. We are only going to have the enzymatic activity of the enzymes that are already present in our tea. So whatever it, let's say, has by itself is what's going to make it develop. Between 60 and 70% relative humidity, one specific type of fungus starts to grow, which is a yeast called Blastobotrys adenivorans. Adeninivorans, sorry. These names are <laughs> very complicated. Now, Blastobotrys adeninivorans is a type of yeast that serves as a source for many enzymes, such as, for example, tannin acetylhydrolase, which is a key enzyme in the degradation of tannins. At 60 to 70% relative humidity, you also get a very low degree of microbial activity. Above 70%, various other types of fungi can grow, in particular uh, those of the Aspergillus variant, including the black Aspergillus, which is considered quite toxic to humans. At this level, we also see an increase in microbial activity. Finally, above 80% relative humidity, we see very strong microbial activity. Um, <laughs> funnily enough, this is something that's desirable in the creation of shoe puerty. The uh, pile fermentation process, if, for those of you that remember, works in a way where the leaves are regularly sprayed with water to maintain a very high humidity, so that the bacteria in the, let's say, sort of shoe poor tea formula, or in the bacterial cultures that's added there, can proliferate at a very high rate and cause rapid fermentation. 
that's it for uh, relative humidity for now. However, not just relative humidity is important. Absolute humidity is also a key factor in producing an aged poor tea that tastes good. Absolute humidity is important because it keeps the volatile compounds inside the tea. Tea that's stored too dry, as a result of that, will have a stale flavor because it lost, has lost these volatile aromatic compounds. Something that's also important to mention here. Uh, yes, I I think I mentioned that Aspergillus is a toxic, or Aspergillus is a fungus that grows at more than 70% RH. And in particular, the black Aspergillus variety can be toxic. Continuing my point from just now, uh, the relation between relative and absolute humidity with regards to temperature is quite important. The same relative humidity at a lower temperature means that you have a lower absolute humidity. In other words, if we want to make sure that we have a certain amount of absolute humidity, but stay within a certain range of relative humidity, temperature is another way in which we can balance out these factors. Finally, there is one more factor that can lead to the loss of volatile compounds, and that is airflow in your storage device or compartment or whatever. Airflow is going to take those volatile compounds in your tea and carry them off into the air, quite literally. So airflow is another thing that should be limited if you want to preserve the aroma of your tea. I'm just gonna work on the second steep now. And while that is going on, let's uh, move to our second part. I've now laid out the basic theory of aging and poor tea, how it functions, which uh, compounds play a role, how we can modify certain things, but one thing we haven't talked about yet are the goals of our poor storage. What exactly are we trying to do with our tea? How do we want it to taste after we let it sit around for several years? Because ultimately what all of this is about is creating an enjoyable experience for us. So. Uh, we need to design our storage in a way that will achieve the goal of producing enjoyable tea. Obviously this is going to be different for everyone, but I think there are a few things that uh, people generally praise aged poor tea for that we can sort of stake out as goals for storage. Oh yeah, Robert, um, sorry, I, I only mentioned bacteria in the context of poor product, uh, shoe poor production because those are also important there while we want to avoid them in shang poor aging. So fungi uh, both, let's say, have their uses in aging shang poor and in producing shoe poor, while only shoe poor uh, really involves bacterial activity. Okay, getting back on topic, uh, storage goals. So first of all, I think it's preferable that we preserve the aroma of our tea. As much of these volatile compounds as we can keep in, uh, the more volatile compounds we can keep in our tea, the better. To achieve that goal, we need to reduce airflow in our storage and we need to keep the absolute humidity of our tea above 5%. The second goal 
we can look at is reducing the bitterness and astringency of our poor tea. We do that by promoting the degradation of polyphenols through enzymatic activity and by promoting the growth of Blastobotrys adenivorans. I'm sorry if I keep getting the name wrong. Uh, saying Latin names in English is very difficult. <laughs> um, Alright. After that, uh, th this one might be more of a personal thing, because some people might really enjoy those tastes, but I personally would like to avoid them. So, I would like to try to avoid the musty or dank taste and aroma that comes with microbial activity in poor tea. And finally, of course, to, uh, let's say, keep ourselves alive, we want to avoid the growth of toxic fungi in our tea. Both of these goals can be achieved through the same means, simply by keeping the relative humidity of our tea below 70%. Okay, and with that, the, uh, let's say, factors, the three factors we can control in uh, poor storage, in any kind of storage environment, oh god, I completely forgot about my second steep, sorry, um, are humidity, temperature, and airflow. I'm just gonna decant this real quick, uh, set up the next steep, and then have a quick sip before we talk about how we can control these factors. I hope you're all uh, able to follow along so far. Let me know if you have any questions. I haven't really seen any in chat so far, but if there's anything that's unclear to you, just feel free to put it in chat and I'll try to uh, answer it to the best of my abilities. I've also seen people talking about storage in Florida, and yes, uh, Florida is would probably be a prime candidate for, uh, let's say, high intensity or high speed poor storage with uh, 80 plus percent humidity. Yeah, Robert, thanks for pointing it out, because that is definitely the, uh, like, what happens in pile fermentation, which compounds are active, etc. is definitely something that people can often get confused over. Is the Forgotten Brew as bitter with aged tea as it is with young tea? I don't think so, no. And the reason for that is because, uh, as I just outlined earlier, in a properly aged tea, many of the compounds that contribute to bitterness, all of these uh, various polyphenols, the tannins, the flavonoids, the catechins, etc., have been broken down by the enzymes to some extent. So even if you oversteep it, it will usually never get as bitter or as astringent as a younger tea. Ah, okay. Alright, I'm... Uh, I have sufficiently filled myself up with tea to keep going, so let's do just that. The first control factor to talk about here is airflow. As stated, we want to reduce airflow to preserve aromatic compounds in our tea. We also, at the same time, want to reduce the risk of over-oxidation. Because if, if our tea oxidizes too much, it's not really uh, ideal. Because we're going to lose a lot of good stuff. Um, Ralph points out that I had mentioned a high temperature and low humidity gets better results than lower temperature and higher humidity. Uh, yes, I have mentioned that. And... Uh, in essence, that is what I'm going to say today, so uh, stay tuned for that. I'm, I don't think I'm going to contradict myself. Getting back to airflow, 
Airflow is very easy to control by keeping poor in a closed environment. What kind of environment can this be? It could be a box, it could be a well-sealed closet, something like this. Just some place where you don't have a lot of airflow. When it comes to temperature, uh, as outlined earlier, the sweet spot for enzymatic activity is 35 to 40 degrees. So in order to control our temperature, we need to find a way to keep temperature consistently high. However, with that comes a potential concern. If the difference between our storage temperature and the temperature in our room is too high, we might risk condensation, like in our uh, storage device, which then of course can lead to uneven humidity, which can cause unwanted growth of aspergillus and some microbial activity. Basically, if you get condensation and some drops drip onto your poor tea and you get a really wet spot, that can cause some very unwanted fungal and microbial activity. With this in mind, both keeping temperature consistently high, but also making sure we don't get condensation, we want to look for some kind of thermal isolation for our poor storage device. This thermal isolation would also make it so that our own room temperature has less influence on our storage temperature. Because, for example, I have one box of poor tea that is, let's say, ready for immediate drinking that I just keep in my room. And at the same time, I also have another box that I'm going to be talking about later that does require thermal isolation. So the uh, well-being of the poor in my room temperature box would depend entirely on what my personal room temperature is. Okay, now the third factor to look at is humidity. We want to keep the relative humidity of our poor tea between 60 and 70% to promote the growth of that one specific yeast I mentioned, but also to prevent microbial activity and to prevent the growth of potentially toxic fungi. We also want to keep the absolute humidity of our poor above 5%, to keep those volatile compounds in there, to retain as much aroma as possible. To do this, we need some way to control the humidity of our tea. And as a secondary goal, to some extent we want to maximize the absolute humidity in our tea, but without passing the upper levels of relative humidity. So to sum all of this up, we want to reduce airflow, we want to keep our temperature high, but not too high compared to our room temperature. I'd say within about 10 degrees of your room temperature should be fine, as long as there's some form of thermal isolation. And we should keep our relative humidity between 60 and 70% while maximizing our absolute humidity. All right. Before we go on, I'm uh, gonna pour out my third steep, gonna finish my second steep, and I'll reboil the water real quick, and then we'll start talking about how we can realistically achieve these goals. So I'll be back in a moment, my water's gonna boil now. Uh, I hope you're enjoying your tea in the meantime.
Okay, sorry for the quick break, my water is boiling now, I'm uh, ready for the next steep. And uh, let me close these slides real quick, because we've got through all of the theory. Now it's time to start talking about more practical matters. Let's move on to our third section. How can we achieve these storage goals? The first one to talk about is reducing airflow, creating a closed environment of sorts for our poor. The key measure in this case is gas permeability, a measure of how well an atom is able to pass through a material or a membrane. We should try to keep our poor in a storage device that has low gas permeability particularly with regards to oxygen, because, as we mentioned earlier, we don't want too much oxidation to happen to our poor. There's two steps that we can do to achieve this low airflow and low gas permeability. The first step is keeping poor in a, a low airflow environment. Some type of closed box is probably ideal for this, but as I mentioned earlier, if you have a uh, closet or a drawer or something that closes off well, that could also be an option. Another way to reduce airflow is simply by having a lot of tea, and that's how it's usually done in China. Because when you have a lot of poor tea, in a tight space, of course, not a lot of airflow is possible overall. So if you have these tongs of various bing cha stacked upon and next to each other in these large boxes and boxes upon boxes next to each other in a big warehouse, there isn't going to be much airflow for your tea. So that uh, would be a more, let's say, natural way of keeping uh, airflow minimal. Now, of course, most of us are not uh, the kind of people that keep literal tons of poor tea uh, in their homes. So we need to find a different method of achieving this. And for this, I think we can look at a second step in our uh, poor storage device that aims to reduce airflow and gas permeability. The second step would be some form of enclosure for our poor. The paper wrappers that poor tea usually comes in are highly gas permeable. And even like polyethylene Ziploc bags have a permeability of about 6,000 to 15,000 milliliters of oxygen per day, which for our purposes is simply too much. The goal here, then, would be to find a type of bag that has a much lower gas permeability. We want to reduce this flow of oxygen by quite a lot. For the second type of control, temperature control, we also have a couple of steps that we need to take. Firstly, we need to find a box that provides some amount of thermal isolation. Most of these sort of thin plastic boxes that you find at your everyday DIY store are probably not going to get the job done when it comes to that. So we need something a bit more uh, sturdy, let's say. One somewhat popular thing that I've seen people do would be to use uh, cooler boxes, for example, or uh, old fridges, because those devices insulate quite well. The second step for our temperature control would be finding the right temperature range. As I mentioned, we want to maximize enzyme activity, and the sweet spot for that is 35 to 40 degrees, but we also need to pay attention to what's going on around us, because if the difference between our temperature in our room and our temperature in our storage device is too high, it can become quite risky. 
So we, we will need to sort of naturally stay within a certain temperature range. And finally, once we figured out the temperature range, once, we, uh, once we've got our uh, isol insulating box, we need to uh, set up a way to control the temperature in our box because we want to keep it consistently high. And ideally, we don't want it to be affected by uh, changes in our room temperature, such as opening a window during winter. Lastly, we also have humidity control, and that, to be honest, is the most difficult part by quite a fair margin. There's two reasons for this that are in part uh, compounded by the other things we need to control. The first reason is if we keep our source of humidity for the tea in our warm storage environment, that source might release too much humidity, because that of course is also always dependent on the temperature. At the same time, the lack of airflow and the low gas permeability means that our humidity, if we kept a consistent source of humidity in there with the tea would build up over time. But we want to keep our humidity levels consistent. So low gas permeability in a way eliminates the desire for an external source of humidity when looking at long-term storage. And here's kind of the key point to all of this. If our tea is properly humidified it will act as its own sort of source of humidity, and external sources won't be required. And the conclusion we can draw from this is that for the purposes of aging stuff here at home, we should humidify our poor separately before moving it into some kind of long-term storage for aging. Now lastly, let me talk to you about the best way that I've found so far that combines all of these different factors into an actually applicable method that I think will work quite well for uh, aging poor tea at home in an environment that isn't like uh, those natural storage places we all love. This method is heavily based on Marco Gualtieri's heated storage experiment. Marco is a fairly well-known tea blogger, a uh, very nice person in my experience. You can find him on Instagram, you can find him on his own blog. He uh, also talks about his storage experiment quite a lot. He is, to my knowledge, the first person that uh, has done this kind of stuff and uh, the way I store my tea has been heavily influenced by what he does because I think it's a really good method, and that method is what I would like to show you today. Also, as I've mentioned before, this storage setup is for the purpose of actively aging tea. It's not for short or medium term storage of poor that's already ready to drink. Only try this if you have a tea that you really want to age by yourself at home. If you always buy ready-to-drink poor tea, there's no need for you to do this, unless, of course, you really want to and you enjoy experimenting like I do. But, yeah, I'm doing it and I'm here to talk about it, because, uh, in my personal opinion, Aging tea yourself and trying to figure out how to actually do it is quite the interesting task. So, the parameters of my storage are a consistent temperature of 32 degrees Celsius. While this is not 100% optimal for maximizing en uh, enzymatic activity, 
It's a good compromise with my own room temperature that tends to hover somewhere around 23 degrees Celsius. The target humidity for my poor bings, or bricks or tours, whatever I'm storing, is 62 to 66% relative humidity at 32 degrees Celsius and at least 5% absolute humidity. The way I do this is in a two-phase storage setup. The first phase involves the individual humidity conditioning of poor bings to my target humidity of 62 to 66 percent at 32 degrees Celsius in a small box that contains one of these 69% uh, Boveda packs. While this tea is conditioning, I keep track of the humidity development with a hygrometer in that small box. Once I've hit my target humidity, I remove the Boveda pack and keep the tea in that small box for a few more days to make sure that the humidity is stable because sometimes you can get small spikes or dips in humidity and that's kind of something you want to avoid you want to make sure that your tea really is at that target humidity because if you're going to be putting it into long-term storage and letting it sit for i don't know like one to five years or something you want to make sure it's in a good spot uh, yeah, John, it's heavily influenced by Marco, and uh, he deserves a lot of credit on this stuff. I think the kind of experiments and the way he documents it are really amazing. Alright, so after we've conditioned our tea to that appropriate humidity, we seal this conditioned pour in a mylar bag. The reason we're using mylar bags is specifically because of their low gas permeability. Where uh, polyethylene Ziploc bags have 6,000 to 15,000, uh, what was it, milliliters of oxygen per day, mylar bags have about 50. So the gas permeability of those is way, way, way lower, and it precisely fits the kind of things we're trying to do with our storage here. Finally, my box contains a heat mat that's connected to a thermostat that's set to 32 degrees Celsius. And that's kind of the basic setup. Now I'm going to show you some photos of what my actual storage unit looks like and we can talk about that. So first of all, Let's see, uh, this is the image I also posted on Instagram yesterday evening. Here's what my box looks like from the outside. This is a uh, styrofoam thermo box, the same kind of thing that uh, food delivery services use to keep their food warm while it's being delivered. While this isn't like the most ice, uh, insulating device in terms of thermal insulation it quite easily gets the job done and it's very affordable i bought this box for i think like five euros so if you need a cheap way to create thermal insulation this is a good bet now let's take a closer look at this cable setup here what do i have i have two heat mats inside of this box to sort of create two different layers then I have a thermal probe going into my conditioning box to make sure that I uh, keep my 32 degrees consistent. My heat mats and the thermal probe are connected to a thermostat that's set to constantly be at 32 degrees. Alright, after this... Uh, let's take a look at what's going on inside of the box. Here we have the, uh, let's say, conditioning compartment. The small uh, plastic box on the right. Right now I've got uh, a part of a 
Lung Her 2006, I think 8539 in there. That's in the middle of conditioning right now. It's a bit difficult to see, but uh, on the right, you can kind of see the thermal probe sticking in there, and the hygrometer, I think, is kind of hidden behind the wrapper. But yeah, this is where I'm measuring my temperature. Underneath this, you can see the uh, upper layer heat mat. There's another one on the bottom of the box. These are fairly, let's say, weak heat mats. I think they're, they're at like 70 wa uh, 17 watts. And they're usually used to heat up terrariums and that kind of stuff. So, uh, it's recommended to be conservative with this because obviously when your box is made from styrofoam, you don't want to go too hot or the whole thing might burn. And we really don't want that. Now, on the left side of this uh, conditioning box, you can see one of these mylar bags. Uh, mylar bags, from my understanding, are bags that sort of have a layer of aluminum, which helps uh, reduce that gas permeability by a great extent. Uh, the ones I use are heat sealable, because we, my family also likes to do sous vide a fair bit, so we have one of those heat sealing devices, but a uh, regular sort of Ziploc type Mylar bags do the job almost as well. So if you don't want to get into heat sealing, those are also an option. And finally, underneath this top layer, we have the bottom layer. <laughs> as you can see, I've, uh, I've had this going for quite a while. It usually takes about a month for one of these bings to reach the proper humidity levels that I would like. And after that, it goes into one of these bags. I mark the bag to uh, show what kind of tea is in there. And then I put it on that ground floor. The way I envision it, I'm not entirely sure if this is accurate, but uh, the hygrometer and thermometer readings I've done so far seem to indicate that the bottom layer is a bit more consistent when it comes to maintaining those 32 degrees. So, that's where most of my long-term storage is happening. <sighs> Alright, uh, now that I've shown you what my storage setup looks like, uh, I'm back, hello again. I hope this was uh, an interesting view and an interesting showcase of a storage method that I personally find quite promising and that I don't think enough people have adopted yet. Obviously, like uh, some people in chat are pointing out, there are a few risks with this kind of storage. In particular, uh, if, let's say, for example, you go on vacation and you get a power outage and your thermostat doesn't turn back on, then uh, you could get a lot of condensation in your box and it might ruin your tea. But if you're the type of person that has tends to stay at home and that can dedicate a bit of time to uh, monitoring what your tea looks like every day, then I think this is quite promising. <sighs> now, now that you've uh, heard about my tips and my experience with poor storage, you might want to compare them with Gabriela. So if you haven't watched his videos yet. He made two videos about poor storage and he's currently working on a third right now. As I mentioned at the start of the stream, I haven't watched those videos. So that's the first thing I'm going to do after the stream because I'm very curious about what he has to say compared to what I have to say. I'm pretty sure there's going to be some differences between my live stream and his videos and we might even contradict each other in a few spots, but in some way, I think that's kind of the beauty of uh, tea. Even when it comes to technical aspects, like how we execute a certain storage plan, or what that plan even is in the first place. Personal experience will result in major differences, not just in terms of the method we take, but also in terms of preferences. Like, 
I know that I prefer tea that's stored basically just like this one, where it has a certain intensity of storage, but it shouldn't quite be at that kind of dank or musty level yet. And I'm trying to find the kind of setup that will let me achieve this sort of storage by myself. Because aged tea, as time goes on, will probably be harder and harder to come by. So I want to make sure that, in theory, I could buy a tea and sit on it for a fairly long time. But yeah, that uh, is my storage setup. I hope I also gave you some insight on how just poor storage works in general and the chemical and biological processes that stand behind poor storage. I hope uh, I was able to give you, let's say, an informed overview about this whole topic. It's honestly a very deep and very complicated topic that isn't very well understood, even after all of the research I've done for this stream. I'm not entirely sure about several things, but uh, now that we've gotten through all the theory and all of my praxis, let's uh, open up the floor for some questions. So if there's anything you, you're wondering about, uh, please go ahead. I'm already seeing a few questions in the chat, so I'll get started on answering these. Mm. Just finishing this steep real quick. Alright. How do you feel about people uh, paying big money for single origin young poor only to rush aging by putting it in a pumidor and exchange lo losing much of its region specific taste? Very good question. Uh, also slightly loaded question. Now, personally, I think uh, people that do that are sort of conflating two kind of principles when it comes to educating oneself about poor. On the one hand, there's the education in terms of terroir and uh, regional characteristics of poor, how these characteristics influence the taste, and what uh, kind of taste-specific regions are known for. That's why they buy expensive, single-origin, high-quality poor. And I think that's a good thing to educate oneself about, but kind of like you mentioned, I don't think there's much of a point in trying to age that kind of tea as quickly as possible. Because if you're trying to learn from it, and you're trying to learn what a specific region tastes like, then the best thing you're gonna get is the young taste of that tea. The other kind of concept that people I think are getting in there is just that in general aging tea is good and we want to do it, so they're gonna try to do it with that kind of tea. And that one I'm not entirely sure about. I think other types of tea lend themselves more towards aging, especially, let's say, accelerated aging, like the thing I'm trying to do. And, yeah, it's kind of complicated. At the same time, one thing that does need to be said in favor of aging single origin teas is that it will give you an idea of how teas from those specific regions age. Like, even uh, even if the chemical processes are sort of the same across all kinds of poor tea, when it comes to how it works, the actual ratios of the different uh, compounds differ, of course. And ultimately, that's going to produce a different taste. So uh, teas from different regions are also going to age differently, which in itself is an interesting concept to explore. Personally, I'm I'm not sure if it's worth the money, because when you buy really expensive, high-quality, good, young Shang material, I think the best point to enjoy it is probably when it's still young, but if you can't finish it within a given time frame, then I think uh, seeing how it develops over the years and sort of exploring that axis 
is also a fine thing to do. Ultimately, it's up to what you want to do with your tea, really. Okay, next question. Uh, what do I think about Myla versus regular sous vide bags? Honestly, I've never tried sous vide bags. Um, I'd imagine they'd probably be fine. One slight thing I might be concerned about is like whether there's any kind of plastic aroma to them. But given that they're meant for cooking stuff, and they're obviously like food safe, etc., I think it should probably be fine. Though, obviously I don't know their gas permeability off the top of my head, so it might just be that for some reason they're not water permeable, but some of the gases might get through. So, if you want to research more about the suitability of sous vide bags for uh, long-term poor storage, gas permeability is what I'd look into. Alright, what other kind of questions do we have? We've got from uh, Gabriele on the road himself. What about storing Shang and Shu poor together? Uh, um, I don't really think I can give an educated opinion on that, to be honest, because I'm just not a shoe drinker, so I don't have any shoe that I'm storing, which means that my storage is entirely Shang. I have heard that people recommend storing them separately because there might be some aroma transfer and whatnot, but obviously if you're using a storage setup like mine, where each individual tea is in its own Mylar bag, there's no reason not to store Shang and Chu together if you also want to store your Shupua that way, because there's definitely not going to be any aroma transfer between those Mylar bags. Can you explain the exact process that causes aging? And what is the name of that bacteria? Um, I have done that at the start of the stream, so... After the stream is over, please go back and watch the start, where I try to explain it to the best of my abilities. It's not the perfect explanation, but I hope that it's possible to do... to take something away from it. Uh, Ralph mentioned that Shu is mostly meant to air out and finish oxidation on unwanted matter, so it should need airflow, and yeah, it's a... A lot of people, from what I've seen, say that uh, Shu needs to air out. For the brief period that I uh, spent drinking Shu, I can definitely agree that this seems to be the case, where the young shoes I've had have all had sort of unpleasant aromas that uh, needed to dissipate, but something people rarely talk about is what needs to be done after you finish airing out your shoe, because I don't think it's kind of like locked or frozen in time at that point. It's still gonna keep developing, and shoe storage is something that people should look into a bit more, I think. Because I don't really see why it shouldn't have a big effect. Yeah, Gabriele also just mentioned that there's very little research done on shoe storage, so we definitely agree on that. Uh, John B says, on a recent Between the Two Teapots podcast, Lawrence Zhang, for those of you who don't know, that's Marshall N, uh, mentioned that storing tea in a more humid environment for a time, for example five years, then onto dry storage is standard. Uh, yes, that is what's known as traditional storage, mostly in the context of places like Hong Kong, where uh, they have a period at the start of a poor storage life where it um, spends some time in a fairly high temperature and humidity environment before then being add out and moved into natural storage. So one thing you would often see, for example, is that a tea would be produced, then sent to Hong Kong for initial storage, and then sent on to Taiwan for uh, natural storage for a long time. So many 
slightly more aged teas are going to have that kind of history. All right, do we have any other questions? How's, uh, how's everyone enjoying their teas so far? We've already been here for an hour, so these sessions should be quite far on the way. Where do you buy good square mylar ziplock bags? Um, if you ask me after the stream, either on Instagram or uh, Discord or something, I can send you a link to where I bought mine, if I can still find it. They're not too difficult to find, but it might help. When you are aging tea, how often do you take them out to taste the progress, or how do you decide when it's ready? Ah, uh, that's, that's kind of difficult. Um, it's a very subjective thing. Tea being ready entirely depends on when you feel like it's ready. When you enjoy the tea of uh, the, the taste of a tea, that's basically when it's ready. There's also a slightly different way to view this, where in essence a tea is never ready because it always keeps evolving and changing. So rather than saying, okay, at this point my tea is ready and I'm this is how I'm gonna keep it forever, uh, you as a person kind of grow along with your tea. You keep tasting it and it keeps developing over the years and uh, what you appreciate about the tea is the way in which it changes. When it comes to checking how far along my tea is, I try to check my Mylar bags uh, Somewhere between every six months to uh, months to every one year, depending on uh, how how I feel, whether I want to drink them at this point or not. But something in that time frame should work fine. I recently did test one of my teas after I think nine months for that one, and the change was already quite significant. Maybe at some point I could do like a follow-up stream or a video or something where I compare um, the notes I took on a tea when I sent it into conditioning compared to uh, when it was done conditioning and was moved into long-term storage and then like one year later. Because I think that might be quite interesting just to see how a specific tea develops. Anything to take into consideration when you take out tea from the Mylar bags? Um, yes. Because those teas are heat sealed, I'm going to have to re-steal them again. So when I cut off the top, I make sure not to cut off too much. Because uh, otherwise the bag might get too small. Or anything I should do before placing them back in storage. Um, I'd say just general hygiene procedures, so yeah, make sure your hands are pretty clean, uh, don't have any unpleasant odors in the uh, vicinity of your tea, that kind of stuff, but I don't take any, like, very specific things. I do try to minimize the time they spend outside of the box, so if I take out a tea, I usually like have my utensils and my scale etc ready to go. I just pop it onto my uh, desk, break off a piece, make sure it's the right weight, and then I put it back and heat seal it ASAP. The, the whole process takes maybe like two or three minutes. I think it's not an issue if it takes longer, probably... If you, even if you, it takes like half an hour to an hour, it's probably fine, honestly. Just uh, try to minimize that time spent outside of the box, wherever you can. No, no, no. Uh, that's a very important thing, Gabriele. I do not, yeah, I, I don't keep a Boveda in the Mylar bag. That's like the most important thing. And uh, something I should probably say here is, this is actually my second attempt at heated storage. I did another attempt back in late 2018, 
where I made the crucial mistake of actually keeping both of the packs in my bags. And uh, for various reasons, please don't ever, ever do that. You're going to get so much mold. It's going to be terrible. You're also going to get condensation, you're going to get too much humidity, it's, it's a mess, don't do it. Please, condition your cakes, then move them into mylar storage by themselves. Don't keep both of the packs in your mylar bags. Also, I'm gonna reboil my water real quick, so please give me a minute and please uh, keep asking questions. Okay, my water's boiling, I am back. I'm uh, going to decant this now. And we have a few more questions. Um, first of all, do I have Bovida packs in the styrofoam box? No, I do not. The only place in the heated box where I have uh, Bovida packs is in that small plastic box for conditioning. Let me uh, show you the picture again. In this box on the right side, that's the only place where both of the packs go in my setup. All of these Mylar bags have already conditioned uh, poor bings in them, so there's no need to have a Bovida there. And due to the very low gas permeability, I also don't need to humidify the inside of the styrofoam box as well. Uh, Patrick. I wasn't clear on the top versus bottom layer of the storage setup, so there, there's no real distinction there. I just have two heat mats in there, so I have more, so that I can better exploit the vertical space of my box, essentially. And uh, the heat mat on the top is where I have my conditioning box and one other Mylar bag right now. And in the bottom layer, I just have a bunch of other bags with tea that I would like to store. Um, there was one other question. Is there a type of shang that would be better suited for relatively drier storage? You don't mean the, like, oolong pua theme? A style not made to age? Do any transition better slowly? Ooh, that's another thing that's, I think, essentially down to personal preference. Like, some people definitely prefer the slower aging style of places like Kunming. And I'm not really sure if there's a tea that's better suited towards either storage. It's... I think it's really more about what you prefer in terms of taste. But that's a question I'm going to keep thinking about after the stream and seeing if I can come up with an answer for that at some point, because it's very interesting to think about. Let's see, do we have any other questions? Uh, is it possible to fix storage faults like uh, too low humidity for a long time or too high humidity? I'd say it is possible to some extent. Uh, if you're... but I'm, I'm not quite sure to which. I haven't been storing tea long enough to really be able to say. But I think if your tea's been stored too dry, Giving it more humidity might fix it. It is going to depend on how many of your enzymes are left in the tea. Like, if for some reason everything in there died off, uh, then 
I don't think you'd be able to save it. But some of these enzymes and fungi are really hard to kill, and uh, most of the time they just go dormant and are reactivated if you provide them with the right conditions. Tea that's been stored too humidly... Uh, I'm not sure if you can really fix it, because I think the kind of stereotype or thing a lot of us have heard about with regards to the like wet storage nightmare, the this kind of very off-tasting, off-putting, poor... I'm, I'm not sure if that one can be fixed, to be honest. Like, at some point, the degradation of your cell structures in the tea and the degradation of your polyphenols has gone so far that there just isn't much of anything left and I don't feel like it can be saved at that point but that point is also very hard to reach unless you actively go extremely extremely hard on your storage okay uh, John B one thing I don't think I've experienced this shang turning sour from being stored to dry from hearsay about that happening. Is this familiar? Something you've ran across? Ah, uh, um... Sour... So, if... I... I feel like this statement is often made in the context of, like, short to medium term, uh, medium term storage of young shang -Pua. And... That is something I personally haven't seen too much of yet. One thing that I have experienced when it comes to long-term storage that's too dry is that the flavors in there kind of become confusing. It's, it's sort of difficult to describe, but when your tea's been stored too dry, I feel like uh, the clarity of the individual flavors of the tea isn't really there and all becomes kind of muddled and muted and while you sort of get the general sense that some flavors are present there it's very it, it's almost impossible to make out what it's really supposed to be and it yeah it, it can only really be described as confusing in my opinion Uh, I just tuned in. Will this be on replay? Yes, there will be a video of this on the Nanwashan channel after it's finished. Did you measure the humidity in the Mylar bags years after conditioning? Um, I'm only just about to finish my first year, but my plan is to figure out a way to uh, measure the humidity of my Bing when I open it. I'm not 100% sure how I'm going to do that yet, but I would like to find a way. If you have any ideas for that, please let me know. Uh, Patrick says, one uh, hygrometer for the plastic box and one for the entire box. Right now, I'm only using one hygrometer for the conditioning box. I don't really need to monitor the humidity in the styrofoam box. Uh, Ralf asks, what's the lowest possible humidity to keep it from getting damaged in the long run? I'd say you shouldn't go below 6... Uh, I don't know. You could probably go below 60% if you really only wanted the enzymatic activity of the existing enzymes in your tea. But I think when it comes to not getting it damaged, you need to look at the absolute humidity more than the relative humidity. So... You want to keep your absolute humidity above 5%, and it will probably be fine if you can make that happen. So, if you don't do heated storage, uh, you need to find a way, or you need to keep your relative humidity at such a point where the absolute humidity of your tea will be above 5% at the temperature you store it at. That's really all I can say. Uh, what type of damage do you expect at low humidity? The main type of damage we can expect is uh, the loss of volatile compounds, like I mentioned earlier. Mm. Outside of that, um, one thing I haven't really found much information on so far 
is how well these uh, enzymes and these fungi can survive if they're uh, depraved of, humid uh, of humidity. I have found the like optimal ranges for them to grow in or to be active, but I'm not sure if they actually die off or just go dormant at these low humidities. That's something I would like to find out, and if any one of you can point me towards any kind of research in that regard, please let me know, because I'm really curious and I don't know that myself. Robert mentions that one way to keep track of the humidity inside of a mylar bag would be with a calibrated hygrometer, and yeah, that's... Uh, that's true. That's a very good point. That's something I could do. I could get another hygrometer, ideally one that can send data to an app or something. And that would be a way to keep an eye on that in the long term. Whew, okay. This, uh, I'm, I'm glad I set aside some time for people to ask questions about the stream because I kind of anticipated that there would be a lot of questions and back and forth. Since this is such a complicated topic. Ah, Gabriele mentions that he stored Shang for about 10 years at low humidity. He'd say around an average of 40%. And his uh, Shang developed very little over the first few years, but there was a clear change after about 6 years. See, that's also very interesting to me. Because I... Like... The question that springs up in my mind when I hear that is what could have happened to the tea that it would not change for such a long time and then suddenly undergo a significant change? What, what kind of activity in the tea could have made that happen? I think that's something that should also be investigated further. So if anybody uh, would like to fund some research on poor tea, uh, please let me know. Jens mentions that's after the in-between time, right? In-between time is another one of those concepts where I'm still not 100% sure it how it exists. Like, I, I get it on the basis of there's one point in time where poor is young and another point in time where poor is considered aged or mature, and then there's the time it spends in between where those, like, processes are happening. But... How exactly that phase is meant to be defined is something that kind of eludes me, to be honest. And if that phase exists, I think its duration and the point of time at which it takes place would also heavily depend on uh, your storage method. So I think uh, the in-between phase isn't necessarily something we should talk about when we uh, discuss, like, the year, the, the, the amount of years a tea has spent in storage, etc. And I'd rather leave it as something we talk about when we discuss our concrete impressions of a particular tea. Because, yeah, like you said, you mentioned starting at about 2.5 to 4 years, and, and that's already a fairly wide range. 
and if we then have the kind of storage that for instance is traditional in Hong Kong then it might be that those teas are still in the uh, high humidity environment that type of storage starts out in and that's going to be completely different etc. Uh, Ralph mentions in a normal environment the fungal activity is at the top after 5 years and it goes back to the uh, beginning activity after 10 years when the catechins are all converted. After that you get different kind of stuff. I'd, I would also be interested to see more information on that. So if any of you in the chat have any more uh, resources to look into when it comes to poor storage, uh, I'm just here to bring you what I've learned so far. I still have a lot to learn. We all, I think, still have a lot to learn. And if there are more resources out there, please let me know. And I'll, I might update some of the information or add onto it that I've presented in this live stream at a future point once I've uh, learned more. Because much like poor storage itself, learning about poor storage is a continuous process and I don't really think there's going to be a be-all, end-all to poor storage and knowledge about poor storage. And yeah, there certainly is a phase where lots of changes in the tea are actively taking place. I can agree to that. And I guess if we want to call the in-between stage that stage, then uh, that would make sense. But I'm not necessarily sure if uh, we really do that justice, if that makes sense, because that term of in-between has certain associations with how people in the tea community use it. And I don't think those necessarily apply. Or, let's say it's it's influenced by certain value judgments that I don't think necessarily need to be made. Maybe let's put it that way. Okay. I'm on my second to last steep now. This uh, tea has gotten a bit lighter from uh, when I had it earlier. But it still shows that uh, rather pleasant cherry aroma that I value it for so much. For those of you that have uh, stuck with me throughout this long and complicated live stream, thank you a lot. I greatly appreciate it. I hope that you were able to gain some additional knowledge. And if you have any further questions about this topic, either feel free to ask now or reach out to me on Discord at GuideRingsT at any point. I'm happy to provide answers where I can, uh, but I I also try to be upfront about the things I don't know because, like I mentioned probably multiple times at this point, there are a lot of things we don't know about storage, and it's a fascinating topic, and I think we all gotta work together to start figuring things out slowly. Okay, just waiting for this final steep to finish. I'll uh, be taking further questions and comments until then. Uh, something that's kind of beside the topic that I would also like to know about is whether you prefer this black background or the white background I used to use in prior streams. Personally, I think this one looks a bit cleaner. But... Uh, it might just be down to preference. Exactly, there is always more to learn. Okay, probably gonna do a couple more minutes on the steep.
Uh, no worries, Gabriele. Yeah, I uh, do indeed monitor. Uh, I don't monitor humidity in the Mylar bags right now, but I would like to start doing so after uh, I open them and try the tea again for the first time. So that's something I'm going to look into in the near future because I am closing in on my, let's say, one year anniversary of heated storage. Any unusual experiences come to mind with mixed H Shang versions or Shang and Chu combinations? Hmm. Unusual experiences. Um, what I can tell you is that on the tea discord there's a friend of mine who loves to blend uh what was it i think basically aged chew and traditionally stored shang together for some very smooth and pleasant sessions i've never tried it myself but he makes it sound very good so uh shout out to my finnish friend kupuntu here if that's something you would personally like to know more about. I recommend reaching out to him and hearing his perspective on that. I don't really tend to mix my teas all that much, to be completely honest. Maybe it's something I should start doing just to see what it's like. Okay, so here's my final steep. Uh, I'm gonna try to show this to you, but the angle is a bit awkward, and I hope I'm not gonna spill everything. But as you can see, the liquor has gotten a fair bit brighter. It's also very clear now. Uh, this tea is mostly done at this point, but it was a good session together with uh, all of you here to watch me ramble on about poor storage for about 90 minutes. Yeah, the leaves uh, also don't have a lot of aroma to give at this point. I think we've extracted most of the things we can get out of it. Yeah. Long session today once again. Um, mine is coming to a close. So is yours probably. Um, I don't feel like there's a lot more to say on this topic for now. But like I mentioned before... Uh, oh yeah, another question from Gabriele. Yes, uh, please go ahead. We'll uh, wait for that one and make that our uh, last question of this stream. Have you tried the effect on taste of using different teapot sizes with Shang? Yes! Yes, I have. That is something I have uh, looked into quite a lot, actually, because... Uh, I, th I think I've talked about you to this theory before, but I'm also going to open it up to the public. And I might have gone into it in one of my personal late night tea session streams from like over a year back. Um, teapot or vessel size matters quite a lot with Shang in particular. My opinion is that um, a larger, a slightly larger vessel size is. Oh, sorry, that was my phone that just dropped from my desk for some reason. Uh, a slightly larger vessel size it has a positive effect on poor taste. I'm, I'm not entirely sure why, and I haven't researched 
potential explanations for that yet, but I feel like with a size that's a bit larger than your typical like 100 milliliters, I'd say somewhere around maybe 180 to 200 milliliters might be ideal from my impressions, but that's a bit too much tea for me for a singular session, so I uh, don't tend to use my larger vessels all that much. The one I use is 120 milliliters, but if I wanted to fully optimize things, I think I'd go for 180 to 200 milliliters. Even larger might be possible too. It probably is, and I know that many... Uh, Eastern drinkers tend to have a preference for larger vessels, I think even upwards of like 300 milliliters. And I can definitely see why. I think a larger volume of water uh, works better for heat retention, which in turn might improve uh, the amount of extraction you get from your leaves. The impression I've gotten so far from my uh, limited experiments with vessel size is that a larger vessel will help you get sort of a fuller or rounder taste. It to some extent feels like you're extracting more things from your tea leaves. I'm definitely looking forward to your uh, video on the topic of Gaiwan or pot sizes though, Gabriele. And to everyone who's watching, I highly recommend that you check that out when it comes out, because uh, I wouldn't be surprised if Gabriel applies some of his knowledge about thermal engineering to that topic, and I think it might be quite useful. But for now... I think... I'm going to... Uh, end the stream here. We've been together for a little over 90 minutes now. And we've gone on a bit of a deep dive about poor storage. I've showed you the method I like best for aging and why I like it best. Uh, obviously in the long term it remains to be seen whether this method is going to be successful but I think it looks very good on paper. In the limited tasting I've done from my box so far, I've already noticed a significant amount of positive changes to the tea I'm storing in there. So I'm quite optimistic. I hope you were able to learn something from this. A few takeaways for perhaps your personal storage goals, even if they might differ from mine. And I'd be curious to see the kind of methods that you all are going to uh, employ in your personal poor storage. Generally, I think what's important is that you understand how the storage works, you formulate your own set of goals for how you want your tea to taste or how you want your tea to, uh, your tea to change, and once you've done that, you should explore the methods and options that are available to you. Regardless of what your personal goals might be, I think using this sort of three-step method of figuring out your own process is going to get you quite far and quite close to what you want to get out of your tea. So, thank you all for joining me. I hope you had a good time. And I hope we'll uh, see each other again soon. I need to get ready for some exams at the end of the month. But after that, I'm ready to deep dive into more tea-related topics. And uh, I hope you'll all join me for that. So uh, please have a pleasant uh, Saturday, a pleasant weekend. And I'll see you all soon. Goodbye.